Welcome, everyone. This is the UFC 204 post-fight show. I'll be your uh, transitional host, Luke Thomas. I am joined, of course, by Danny Segura on the other side of your screen. Danny, let's get right down to it. The main event, Michael Bisping winning via unanimous decision. The scores, 48-47, 48-47, and then 49-46. Let me tell you how I scored it, and then I want to get your perspective, because it's interesting. You did not score it round by round, but kind of as a whole. Mm -hmm. Here's how I had it, and I will admit, that was a very tough fight to score. I want to give the judges some latitude. I recognize the scores. I'm about to tell you, I bet if I watched it again, I wouldn't agree. But in real time, I had it 10-8, round one for Hendo. Rounds two, three, four, 10-9, Bisping. And I really struggled with that fifth round. I gave it a 10-9 to Hendo. For me, 47-47 draw. I don't think the wrong guy won. I think Michael Bisping, while being in a lot of trouble, was the guy who was the aggressor. The 49-46, though, I don't quite understand that. With me saying that, how did you score the fight from your perspective? And who do you think was the right guy who should have won? I mean, yeah, that 49-46 is, is ridiculous. We can all agree on that. Um, I had the fight, uh, you know, when when there's certain fights that I'm, like, so invested in just watching them that I kind of just forget about scoring. But at the end of the round, I still have, like, a general picture of, like, what happened and who won. Um, and I was really leaning, you know, towards giving Dan Henderson that, you know, that first round uh, a 10-8. Obviously, he dropped them. Uh, he dropped Bisping, and Bisping looked, you know, in, in a lot of trouble. And then you see the rest of the rounds – Bisping won, but, you know, just by a little bit. So it's not fair to give Dan Henderson, you know, a 10-9 for the first one. And then the rest, uh, you know, for Bisping as well, a 10-9. So um, I had it either a draw or, or Dan Henderson winning. Hmm. Uh, again, 10-8 the first round. Uh, and then I thought Dan Henderson took the last round as well. And then, um, maybe one in you know, the middle. Two, yeah, 2-3 two, and, and, and 4, I thought, you know, uh, Bisping took it. But then, uh, obviously, you, you know, round number 3 was very – or 2, was it? That was very close. Uh, an incredible fight. Dan yeah. Henderson drops him in the first. I thought that fight was going to be over. Somehow Michael Bisping manages to persevere. Gets dropped in the second one, but it wasn't nearly as bad. Bisping able to lock up full guard uh, and then basically just stall it out. from Not stall it out, but essentially not take any damage mm -hmm. from there. Third round, I thought he really came to life. Fourth round, there was that, you know, I don't want to call it nut shot that Timberland yeah, holds is about. But that was his round. That fifth round, kind of close. You know, that rolling axe kick. I guess I'd ask you this. What did you make of both guys' performances now that they met a second time seven years later after UFC 100? To be honest, I was very impressed with Dan Henderson. I feel like I've gotten sort of used to seeing him, you know, get run over in the first round, in the first couple rounds, or destroy in the first round. So, you know, watch him go five rounds. And, you know, he was tired, but, you know, he was still competitive. I mean, obviously that fifth round uh, was very competitive. Um, I was very impressed by his performance. Um, but with, with that being said, I still, I'm still i still pretty happy he retired. Um, with Bisping, I don't know. This is a guy that, you know, uh, Dan Henderson, that, you know, if, if you're really elite, like, you should be – uh, you should be beating Dan Henderson. I mean, we've seen Gegard Musasi do it, Vitor Belfort do it, and then, you know, Michael Bisping sort of had a few issues with Dan Henderson. Um, so I wasn't too impressed with, with Michael Bisping. Really? So you saw what happened after the fight. Here's the issues for me as Bisping. He took a lot of damage, both facially, and, you know, he got rocked pretty bad, was asking Justin Perillo, what did I get hit with? So, you know, this is a guy that's taken a ton of damage over the years, uh, although still seems pretty lucid, in fairness to him. Um, and then called out the rest of the division, basically. So if you're matchmaker, if they hired you tomorrow, what should be next for Michael Bisping? I'm kind of thinking that if Chris Weidman beats Romero, that's probably the direction they go. He is the former champ like Luke Rockhold, but he successfully defended his title a few times. That kind of puts him to me at the front of the pack. What about you? Same. Well, I actually think the, the guy at the front of the pack uh, is Joel Romero. I think, uh, uh, you know, he deserves a title shot. I mean, just beating Jackery. I mean, Jackery, that Jackery bout was seen sort of as a title eliminator, even though it was probably never official. And, you know, he beat Jackery. Um, and then now he's fighting, uh, you know, a former champ in, in, in Chris Weidman. So I think if he beats Chris Weidman, he has to get the title shot. And if Chris Weidman beats Romero, I mean, he beat the guy who, you know, uh, in my opinion, is the top contender. So I think that should be the title eliminator. Um, and I would like to see perhaps, you know, Gegard Musasi fight the winner of uh, Jack Array and, and Rockhold. And what do you say about Dan Henderson's career? Uh, credit to the Manchester crowd chanting yeah. his name. 
uh, as he gave his post-fight speech, which I thought was super classy. I thought Michael Bisping, you know, was proud of his win, but was deferential uh, Mm -hmm. to Dan Henderson. You know, Dan Henderson's career, it it can't be replicated. Like, the things that existed at the time won't be around anymore. Like, where a guy holding two belts in pride, and he beats Fedor Emelianenko and holds a strike force title. And, you know, he never got the uh, UFC title, but he fought Rampage, and he fought Anderson Silva, and he fought all these guys. A first ballot Hall of Famer, and a guy who cobbled together all these wins and belts that literally won't ever be able to be replicated what can you say about the career of Dan Henderson? Uh, I think Dan Henderson will fall as uh, one of one of, or if not the most accomplished MMA fighter um, out there. Just you know, out of the titles he was able to get nowadays, you know, you get the UFC belt and that's as high as you go. You know, maybe like Eddie Alvarez, maybe you can say you know you were a Bellator champion as well. Uh, but I mean, just the fact that he was strike force, you know, pride, and you know, he really uh evolved maybe not evolved but he he like went with as the sport like transitioned from pride you know then really the, the ufc was a top dog and he, he still went to strike force and, and then back to the ufc and let's not forget in the ufc he was a uh, number one contender and was scheduled to fight you know john jones for a title um would, would he w- would have won that fight you know probably not but i mean just the fact that you know he's been so competitive for so many years uh dan henderson truly falls in as, as one of the greatest fighters to ever live uh, it's absolutely true the guy had a career that spanned the development and the boom of mixed martial arts and that sort of speaks to his competitiveness and if you're going to go out one way losing that's a great way to go out right yeah. like you can make a claim 100%. You can make a very clear case that uh, uh, Dan Henderson won that fight. So I'm um, truly honored to have been able to cover his career, and I'm very thankful for it as well. Okay, co-main event. What do you say about that? Gagard Musasi defeating Vitor Belfort, second round KO. What do you think, Danny? Vitor Belfort, should he hang it up? Um, I have a feeling he's not going to hang it up. Uh, I mean, I don't think the UFC has, uh, you, you know, it doesn't have the itch that, that it, it has had with other fighters that, you know, uh, sort of forcing them to hang hang up the gloves. So I think he'll stick around. Uh, should he? Um, I mean, honestly, I don't have an issue if Beto Belfort sticks around as long as he competes uh, with fighters that are sort of in the same space spot that he's in um i wouldn't mind seeing him against an anderson silva you know who knows what happens with rashad evans at ufc 205 uh well they're training they used to be training partners so i don't know if that that'll happen um you know who else uh robert whitaker you know if you match him up against other strikers you know i'm, I'm okay with that as long as you're not pitting him against you know a jackery a Yoel romero a gegard musasi i'm fine with that See, I, I'm, I, I disagree just a little bit only in the sense that like his mm-hmm. contract's expensive you know, you want yep. to see him against the guys where it monetarily makes sense for all the parties involved. Robert Whitaker obviously is a tremendous, tremendous talent. Maybe that's his could be a swan song for him. I'm not mm-hmm. saying otherwise, but I, it, it, there's only a few fights that really make sense for him in terms of um, his his costs and his name value. Just having him fight, and I'm not calling Robert Whitaker a random middleweight, but let's say other random middleweights. Right. Do you think there's really a market for that? Um, I, I mean, Vitor Belfort still, I mean, he was co-meaning, uh, he was the co-main event for this card. Uh, you know, he still has a name. Uh, we've seen that, you know, there's still a market for these guys. We've seen, you know, Tito Ortiz go to Bellator and, you know, draw a lot of views. So there's still a market for these guys. Uh, I have a feeling Vitor Belfort wants to keep on fighting. Obviously, you know, that's how he makes a living. Um, so I don't see the UFC letting him go and, you know, having Bellator pick, pick him up. So I, I think he'll stick around. And again, uh, you know, I'm fine with him, you know, maybe a, a Uriah Hall fight. You know, I'm fine with, with, uh, with you know, him sort of stepping down in competition. And I think that's what he should do if he decides to stick around and, and keep fighting. Uh, let's move through the rest of the card very quickly if we can. Ovin St. Pru losing to Jimmy Manawa via TKO. I also believe in the second round, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, what do you say about this one? Ovin St. Pru is, I think, the more well-rounded mixed martial yeah. artist, but didn't use his more well-rounded abilities, at least not past the first round. Jimmy Manawa chewed him to pieces in the second round. What do you make of that win? Um, it was uh, very impressive. I thought uh, OSP had a slight advantage coming into his fight just because he's like the, the stronger guy and the more athletic, and I thought he could, you know, maybe he doesn't have uh, you know better grappling, but he has stronger grappling. He can force some things on... on uh, 
on uh, Jimmy Manua. So I thought, you know, he was going to do well in that area. But man, Jimmy Manua, Manua just stick to his, you know, clean striking. And, you know, those body shots were like taking the life out of OSP. And, you know, they just kept adding on until, you know, he got that uh, that knockout. And it was a it was a wild knockout. Uh, it, it almost felt, you know, it was surreal. He fell back, OSP fell back, and he had his leg all twisted up, sort of like Krokop as well when he got knocked out by Gonzaga. It was, it was bad. It was really bad. OSP, I thought, was a guy who was doing the right thing in the first round and just sort of got out of it. I'm not sure in the second round. He always appears to be, like, off balance when he strikes. You know, he's always sort of, like, stumbling a little bit. But whatever the case, I mean, he can get it, he can get back on track. It's not a devastating loss, but it was that was the hardest fight on the main card, I think, to predict. Um, also on the main card, Stefan Struve got back to work against Daniel Omilanchuk, winning via submission, I think, also in the second round, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, here's my thought on this. Stefan Struve is back. He's back. He's got yeah. his wheels under him. He's ready to go. I think they should give him a jump in competition. He asked for it. UFC should reward it. You do, uh, do you agree or disagree? I think so, and he made a valid point. You know, he's got to win over uh, the current champ. Yeah. Uh, you know, there is some, you know, fun matchups to put him there. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing him against the Travis Brown, you know, get that rematch in there or an Andre Orlovsky, you know, get a big name and, 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 and see what he can do. Uh, you know, that's that's up to the UFC. I wouldn't like to see him fight the Jared Rochelts of the world and, and you know, these uh, sort of uh, uh, lower tier heavyweights. Uh, I would like to see him, you know, get those big names and, and, and see what he can do with them. And uh, I, I agree with you. He's 100 percent back. Um, you know, before in his past fights, it looks like he didn't really know how to pull the trigger. But here, his striking was on point. He had some, you know, good shots. Uh, and his jiu-jitsu was fantastic. He had a really nice trip that he kept pulling off uh, constantly. And, you know, I thought he looked great. And then in the opener of the main card, Mirsad Bektic, excuse me, Mirsad Bektic gets back to work against Russell Doan. Seemed pretty clinical. Was able to get the takedown, and once he got it, got the back. Once he got that, was able to sink the choke without much issue. Anything to say about Mirsad Bektic? I'm ready to see more from him. I don't think this yeah. totals a lot necessarily, but hey, I'm glad the guy's back, right? Yeah, he's back. Um, you know, ring rust really wasn't an issue for him. He looked on point. You know, his transitions, his grappling looked pretty dominant. Um, you know, again, a, a guy much like uh, Stefan Struve, you know, he's, uh, you know, been killing it. But I would like to see him get those big names just so he can, you know, put his name out there and, and sort of establish himself as one of the top guys. Um, I was just thinking out of the top of my head, perhaps, you know, Hannah Barrao or, uh, you know, Darren Elkins or, you know, sort of a, a step up in, in, in that regard. And then anything from the preliminary card that caught your attention? There were some surprising wins. I was surprised that Albert Tumanov lost the way that he yeah. did. Um, I also, for me, I don't know how you feel about this. Look, Yuri Alcantara is a beast, a super beast. Even when he loses, he gives tough guys tough fights. He doesn't go away easily, but, man, he just ran through Brad Pickett, who's had some yep. a, a lot of bad losses recently, including many by stoppage. Anything stand out to you, maybe that Pickett loss in particular? Yeah, that definitely stood out. Pickett is a guy that I've interviewed before. Obviously, he trains out of ATT in, in Coconut Creek in, in Florida. And, you know, uh, um, you know, I'm from there. Uh, you know, I lived there for a while in South Florida. Um, so this is a guy that I've gotten to meet. And he's told me, he's like, I don't want to stick around. And, you know, I want, you know, my brain tells he's aware of what's going on. You know, mm -hmm. he, he doesn't want to take punishment. He has a kid. He says, I want to be able to talk to my kid and not be able to, you know, uh, stutter and have like you know these horrible conversations. Um, I would like to see him hang him up. I think you know he's 38 already in a division where you know speed is king. I believe he has one and four in his past five fights. Um, you know, and I don't really see him making a title run or re really have anything to achieve. Uh, you know, apart from what he already has achieved. So you know, I think it'd be you know a uh, time to perhaps hang him up. You know, and the way he's been losing, you know, it's it's a great point. It's not like well, he did get submitted, submitted, but I mean, he, the punishment he took to get submitted right. uh, was quite severe. And uh, you know, you certainly don't want to see a guy like that, you know, get put through so much. And no doubt, Brad Pickett has had a very distinguished yep. career, and he's not losing the scrubs, but he's losing a lot more than he's winning, and not in ways that make me all too comfortable. And also on that prelim card, Mike Perry against Danny Roberts. What a fight that was. Incredible, right? Mike Perry, man, when you look at the fight on him, the footage on him from his days in the regional circuit, he has improved dramatically. What a chin on this guy and obviously big power. Uh, was that the most fun fight on the card outside of the main event? I think so. Um, you know, it was it was a it was a wild fight, uh, and it was like very interesting the styles and just to see, uh, you know, Mike Perry go out there and and do what he was doing. He was taking some shots, and you know he 
he got rocked a couple of times, but he's good at, you know, putting on a poker face and pretending, you know, he puts on sort of like a, a mean mug and, you know, pretends it's all cool. But, you know, he was rocked uh, a few times, but, you know, uh, he played it off cool and, you know, he got a really, really impressive victory. All right. You can follow Danny on Twitter at Danny Segura TV. You can follow me at SBN Luke Thomas. Uh, Danny, great job tonight. I, of course, will be in contact with you throughout the week as we have another week of mixed martial arts coverage ahead of us. Uh, for everyone here at MMA Fighting, thank you so much for watching. Please like and share. We always appreciate it when you do. Leave your scores for the main event in the comments. We'll check those out as well. Until next time, for Danny, I'm Luke. I'm glad you enjoyed the fights. We'll see you at the next event.